Hi, and thank you for watching. We are certainly living in unprecedented times where we are witnessing prophecy being fulfilled almost on a daily basis. In today's video, I will be looking at Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the implications of what we see transpiring, and also look at the timing of events that align with what is described to us in the book of Revelation and also other prophetic books. There are also some other interesting discoveries that I would like to share with you today. I apologize for not uploading more frequently, but please join my Telegram channel where I post updates frequently and without the risk of getting more strikes against my YouTube account. The link to my Telegram account is in the description of this video and you are more than welcome to join me there as we watch events unfold before us. Okay, so let us look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the possible implications. Firstly, I have to state that there are multiple narratives in play here. One of these is the narrative of those who control the media and what they want the public to believe is happening and what they are sharing with the public may not always be the truth. I believe the reason for not being 100% honest in what is reported has to do with swaying public opinion in a certain direction. There have been many reports with regards to this invasion on the main media streams that have proven to be false. For instance, explosions that occurred in China in 2015 that are now shown to have occurred in Ukraine. We also have reports such as this one from Fox News, reporting Ukrainians taking up arms, but then showing pictures of people holding cardboard cutouts, which can easily be spotted if one just look a little closer. There are also many photos of President Zelensky shown dressed in battle gear, but where these photos are not in any way associated with the current situation. Most of the photos showing Zelensky as the brave leader of Ukraine on the battlefield have been taken many months ago. On Channel 13 in Israel, a scene from a Star Wars movie with the downed TIE fighter was even inserted as part of their live coverage of the war in Ukraine. Now the question we have to ask ourselves when we see reports such as these is this. Why would false information deliberately be given to the public and why would the media intentionally lie about what is really happening? You will recall that we saw the same issues in the media when the US withdrew its troops from Afghanistan, where a huge blow-up model of a cargo plane was used to show unsuspecting viewers how hundreds of Afghans were trying to board a US military cargo plane that was not even real. Why go to such lengths to lie to the public? Now there is no dispute about the fact that there is a war raging between Russia and Ukraine, but the media may not be sharing information truthfully to viewers and there is a reason for this. I believe that Winston Churchill described this best when he was quoted to have said, Never let a good crisis go to waste, and this quote now being commonly applied to economic and diplomatic crises that are then exploited for political agendas. And that is exactly what I believe is happening here. For years now, tension between the West and Russia has been rising, accompanied by military build-up on the border between Russia and Ukraine, with the Crimea situation already recorded in the history books. On February 21st, Vladimir Putin recognized the two breakaway regions in the Donbas as independent states, and immediately deployed what he termed peacekeeping forces into these regions. On the 24th of February, Putin, after apparently seeing little resistance from the West, took the next step and started invading Ukraine, after explaining and justifying his actions in an almost hour-long televised speech, which by the way was recorded on February 21st, showing us once again that this has all been pre-planned and that Putin is simply following his part of the script. The media then started reporting on intense clashes between Russian and Ukrainian forces with the Ukrainian military and citizens putting up a fierce fight that would seem to have caught Putin off guard, and that has now led to severe consequences for Russia, where many of Russia's banks have now been excluded from SWIFT, the world's financial payment communication system, and where Visa and MasterCard have now suspended their services in Russia, affecting the entire population of Russia. About 75% of financial transactions in Russia can no longer occur, and it is important to keep this in mind as we continue, especially when it comes to the timing of events that we will look at soon. This situation has positioned Putin very precariously. There is not much that he can do now to undo the damage that his actions have brought upon Russia. His acts of seemingly unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, as reported by the media, 
have rallied the West against him and has caused severe consequences for Russia. The old photos of President Zelensky that are being featured, showing him as a brave leader on the battlefield, are certainly swaying many people's opinion of him to be favorable, and for the opinion about Russia to be negative. However, if you do some research, you will find that there are many reports that are being suppressed, in which it is stated that some of the attacks that are occurring in Ukraine is self-inflicted, and then blamed on Russia. Whatever the case may be, if Putin retreats now, he will position himself as the weakest and most irresponsible leader in the history of the world who crashed Russia's economy on his own, and who lost to a military that is far smaller than that of the mighty world power that is Russia. In reality, I believe what is happening here is simply a narrative to explain and give meaning to the reason for the world's economy crashing, and where the intent behind all of this is to take away the means for people to be able to buy and sell without a world government's approval, while at the same time also determining whether individuals are even allowed to participate in financial activities. Just to show you that the war between Russia and Ukraine is shown to us in the iPetco 2 animation, and that this war was planned all along, I would like to thank one of the viewers who pointed this out to me in a comment, but it seems YouTube has now deleted that comment, as they so often do. So to the person who pointed this out to me, thank you for sharing this with us, and I apologize for not mentioning your name, since I do not have it anymore. I will also post a link in the description to the video in which this was referenced. In this scene, do you see the white marks on the ground? Would you believe that hidden in these marks is the head of a bear and what would seem to be the head of Mickey Mouse? That would fit right in with Russia being the bear attacking Ukraine which may be perceived by the world as Mickey Mouse. If you consider the detail that is still coming out of this animation a decade after it was published, you can see that this is all part of an elaborate plan that has as its goal the introduction of the Antichrist to the world. So at this point, the only logical thing that Putin can do to protect his reputation and to ensure that Russia does not disintegrate is to push forward until he has conquered the rest of the world and where he will then be positioned to lay down the rules. From what we have seen in dreams that were given to many of God's children over the past few years, some of which I have shared in previous videos and also from what we read in God's word, a new world power would seem to arise comprising of Russia at the helm, known as Gog and Magog, supported by China, and by what we are now shown through the media, possibly also India, who has thus far refused to condemn Russia. Russia, whose leader is referred to as the King of the North in Scripture, will finally come against God's chosen nation Israel shortly before the Second Coming. Now the Bible tells us that history repeats itself and that our Heavenly Father tells us about the future by pointing us to past events to show us what will happen in the future. That is explained to us in the following two passages. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. That which hath been is now. And that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Our Heavenly Father also challenges those who worship idols to do as He does in the next passage, explaining His use of repeating patterns that are an integral part of Bible prophecy. Let them bring them forth, and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them, and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. In this same passage from Isaiah, where our Heavenly Father explains how He tells us about the future, it just so happens that there would seem to be a reference to exactly what is happening with Russia right now. And we read the following. I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come. From the rising of the sun shall he call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time that we may say, He is righteous? Yea, there is none that showeth, yea, there is none that declareth, yea, there is none that heareth your words. 
This obviously tells us about the Gog and Magog pattern that will once again repeat at the end of the millennial reign and where Satan will be released from prison to deceive Gog and Magog again. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. In our case, however, this passage from Isaiah would seem to suggest that Putin will go much further than just the Ukraine, and he has to if he wants to save his country and while he remains subject to the current world order. This would also suggest that the hooks that are placed in the jaws of Gog can be understood with what is happening to Russia currently. Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. With Russia now facing economic separation from the rest of the world and being severely sanctioned, Putin only has one choice if he wants to come out on top. That would be to conquer the rest of the world, and from what we are shown in God's word, that would seem to be where I suspect all of this is heading. It is not only God's word that is pointing at this, but also our enemy through predictive programming. On this cover of The Economist magazine's weekly edition, which you will note came out on February 19th, well before any conflict started, Putin is shown with paint on himself as he colors the world around Ukraine in red, and that would seem to be the enemy's plan, to have Putin conquer not only Ukraine, but also the world, or at least those nations who could be perceived as a threat. On the cover of the next weekly edition of this magazine, you will see that those who are pulling the strings in the background are asking the right questions again. How far will Putin go? Putin certainly has hooks in his jaw now, and I am pretty certain that what we see happening now between Russia and Ukraine is the beginning of what these prophecies point us to. On the cover of the March 5th edition, the title of this article reads, When Vladimir Putin escalates his war, the world must meet him. Notice it is not if, but when escalation starts, the world will follow suit, and we all have a very good idea of what that is pointing to. I have heard many people comment that we are now in the tribulation and that a pre-tribulation rapture is no longer feasible. I would like to address this next. If you are a student of Bible prophecy, you should be very familiar with the four horsemen that are described in the book of Revelation. There are, however, also other references to them elsewhere in Scripture, and these provide very valuable insight into the timing of events in my opinion. The first rider on the white horse has a crown, also known as a corona, on his head, which we are now all very familiar with, and a bow in his hand, but having no arrows to shoot. This would convey the message of a perceived threat, but being harmless and having the intent to conquer through deception. This is what is written. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Imagine how you would react if you saw a rider on a white horse coming for you with a bow in his hand, and his intent would seem to be shooting arrows at you. This would fill most people with some degree of fear, especially if they did not know that there were no arrows to shoot with. A bow on its own is not that deadly. That is just about the exact situation that we saw around the world over the past two years. People being manipulated through fear even when there was no real threat. To submit their bodies to substances that would not affect only their health, but also their DNA and God's original design with which he created them. 
Next we see a red horse going forth with peace being taken from the earth and a great sword given to this horseman. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. I think that what we see happening between Russia and Ukraine right now is the red horse exiting its stall. We have already seen some of the effects of this horseman, but we have certainly not seen peace being removed from the earth yet. The majority of nations are still living in peace, but already beginning to feel the effects of this conflict on their economies. There is another book in the Bible that describes these horsemen, and that is the book of Zechariah. We read the following, and some interesting aspects that are not shared with us in Revelation are relayed to us in Zechariah's account. I saw by night, and behold a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees, and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still, and is at rest. In this vision, Zechariah is shown the red horse with additional detail that has not been provided in the book of Revelation. That is why it is so important to read all of God's word, because you cannot obtain a full picture if you leave anything out. For some reason the Holy Spirit wanted Zechariah to record the fact that this horseman, riding the red horse, was standing among the myrtle trees, which is mentioned three times in this passage, and behind him there were also white and speckled horses, pointing to these riders having already gone forth. We are also told that it is God who sent these riders to walk to and fro through the earth, and they are now reporting back. In the report that is given, we can clearly see that peace is still on the earth, with the mentioning of the earth that is sitting still and being at rest, which means that the red horse has not completed its function yet, it has not drawn its sword yet, and it has not taken peace from the earth yet. Another interesting aspect is mentioned in the following passage from the same chapter. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem, and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. In this passage we see how the Lord speaks with comforting words in the explanation that follows. And I believe those comforting words are specifically intended for the Church of Philadelphia, who at this point has only a little strength left, but who kept God's word and who did not deny his name, and who have suffered the consequences while patiently enduring. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown." So from what we are shown in these passages, it would seem that the next aspect mentioned in connection with the rider of the red horse follows as soon as our Heavenly Father finishes his explanation. That would be 
peace being removed from the earth after our Heavenly Father removed those who were the custodians of his peace. And I believe Jesus once again addresses those of the Church of Philadelphia in Matthew 5. Please consider the following passages in relation to the fact that we have to do with peace being removed from the earth after the Lord addresses the situation with comforting words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In these passages we see more evidence for God being required to remove His people from the world, if He wants to keep His word to us. God cannot remove His peace from the world without removing those who are the custodians of that peace, as he explains to us in John chapter 14, because that would mean that Hebrews 13 verse 5 and Matthew 28 verse 20 would be invalidated by such an action. And we know that we serve a God who does not lie and who considers his word above all of his name. I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. If you have been persecuted in this world, and even if fellow Christians have said all manner of evil against you falsely for Jesus' namesake, then be encouraged because our Heavenly Father is speaking to you with comforting words today, and letting you know that your suffering that you have endured for Him has been recognized and will soon come to an end. There are also some connections between the horsemen described in Revelation and Zechariah and the events that took place in the life of Job. When the angels presented themselves to God as explained in the book of Job, we are once again shown how they were on a mission, very similar to that seen in Zechariah's account, to walk to and fro in the earth and up and down in it. These are obviously describing two different accounts, but it is a pattern that clearly repeats and to which Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 could certainly be applied. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. For Job, this point in time would reference the instance just before the start of his personal tribulation, in which he allowed the enemy to get to him through fear, but where Job remained committed to God through all of his hardships. There are many other similarities between what we read in Job's suffering and what we are shown in the book of Revelation, as well as other prophetic books, but one that I would like to mention is the boils that covered Job's body, that he scratched with a potsherd, and that references the noisome sores that are shown to us in the book of Revelation on the bodies of those who accepted the mark of the beast. Job's friends also pointed out how those who build their houses of clay are destroyed without any regarding it, and the clay in this passage clearly being linked to the clay that is mixed with the iron in the feet of the statue that was shown to Daniel, and possibly being another instance of a repeating pattern. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his Maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth, 
They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Doth not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Today we know exactly how this passage from Job applies to our situation, where people who roll up their sleeves are allowing their temples or houses to be changed into clay by allowing fear to dictate their actions. Another aspect that stands out in the account of Zechariah is the mention of the myrtle trees. Why would the Holy Spirit have Zechariah record this particular detail three times in this passage? The Hebrew word for myrtle is spelled in the same way as the name Esther. And as I have shown in previous videos, this aspect would seem to be linked to what we read in Isaiah 21, where the horsemen are once again featuring. A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the signs thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain, pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it, I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted, fearfulness affrighted me, the night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed, and he cried, A lion! My Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. O my threshing, and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. There are yet again a few interesting aspects from this passage that I would like to point out. Firstly, in the vision, we are told that the night of Israel's pleasure is turned into fear unto them, and the night in which Israel's feast of pleasure and joy occurs is on Purim. And this then being a very particular connection to the myrtle trees mentioned in Zechariah. This would then be connected to Esther's victory over Haman, which was celebrated by the institution of the Feast of Purim. And Purim this year occurs on March 16th to 17th. In this passage we see another reference to a couple of horsemen, although their colors are not shared, but that is followed by a cry in which the fall of Babylon is announced, and the watchman sees a lion. The same fall of Babylon is announced in the passage from Revelation 18. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Notice how the Lord's people are called out of Babylon so that they would not receive the plagues that will be poured out over her. Does this not sound like our Heavenly Father calling His people out of the world before peace is removed and the judgment starts? Does this not sound like more of our Heavenly Father's comforting words to His people? Such an understanding would fit in perfectly with what we read in Revelation 3, where Jesus promises His people who patiently waited for Him, who kept His word and who did not deny Him, that he would keep them from the hour that will come over the world. 
because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. At this time the watchman sees a lion, and this, in my opinion, would refer to the time when Satan is cast out of heaven, and where the following passage would then apply. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. When Satan is cast out of heaven, as explained in Revelation 12, peace will no longer exist on the earth, and he will seek to destroy as many of God's people as he can, with the great sword that was given to the rider of the red horse. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. When all of these passages that we have discussed today are linked together and when we consider what is now transpiring in the world, it would seem that a very important event may occur around Purim and that this may also mark the point in time where the rider of the red horse will wield his sword and where the roaring lion will be confined to the earth and peace be removed from the earth. This could mean that our Heavenly Father may very well call his people out of this world at that time to fulfill these promises to us, and after which the earth will no longer be sitting still and be at rest. I find it very interesting that events are playing out before us in such a way that they align perfectly with feasts that are pointed out to us in God's word. In the case of Purim, it is not one of our Heavenly Father's ordained feasts, but one that was created by man. It also comes from a book in God's word where God is not mentioned even once which tells us a lot about Israel's relationship with their Messiah at the time when this feast will be turned from joy into mourning, as explained in Lamentations 5, where we see another link back to Zechariah, where the same question is asked regarding how long the Lord will reject Israel. The joy of our heart is ceased, our dance is turned into mourning, the crown is fallen from our head, woe unto us that we have sinned, for this our heart is faint, for these things our eyes are dim. Because of the mountain of Zion which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. Thou, O Lord, remainest for ever, thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us for ever, and forsake us so long time? If we consider the current situation between Ukraine and Russia, Putin can logically not wait for months to act because the longer he waits, the more damage Russia suffers as a result of sanctions, especially the economic sanctions that are affecting the entire population of Russia. A war effort adds additional strain on a country's resources, and not being able to transact will make it very difficult for Putin to wait for any extended period before he acts, as every new day that follows the start of his invasion will see more of Russia's resources being wiped out. It is almost as if we can hear Jesus' words to Judas in this regard, just before Judas betrayed him. And after the sop Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. As I have stated many times before, I am not a prophet, and I am simply studying God's word and looking at how current events align with what we are told in God's word, and how this may point to the timing of our escape from this world. According to Hebrews 10, and if we heed our Saviour's instructions that are given in Luke 21, if we are watchful, we are supposed to see the day of our redemption approaching. I am not saying that the rapture will definitely happen on Purim this year, but I am certainly looking at this time as one of the highest watch windows in which something could happen. I believe we may even have a few events preceding our escape that could confirm this understanding for us, if we look at what our enemy shows us through predictive programming. 
From what we are shown in the iPetco 2 animation, we have already seen how many aspects shown to us in this scene of the animation has now come to pass. Tanks have started rolling shortly after the start of the Chinese New Year of the Tiger. What we have not seen yet is the mediation that is referred to in this scene and that will likely be triggered by what is shown to us here. If nuclear devices come into play, as is being hinted at in reports that I just saw today, it would be a good reason to try and mediate between the parties before the entire world is destroyed. But remember, Putin now has a hook in his jaw and anything other than being victorious in this war will make him look like a loser. I believe it is very likely that nuclear armaments will soon be used in this war that will then call for mediation and that Angelina Jolie, who has apparently been designated for this role, will then try to get the warring parties to agree to peace and safety as explained to us in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3. And this is when God's judgment over the world could start and where the rider of the red horse will then wield the great sword. This can however only happen after a loud trumpet sound that will be heard around the world and only after our Heavenly Father first removes that part of the harvest that belongs to Him and who are the custodians of His peace on the earth. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We only have a few days until Purim will be upon us, and although what we see happening in Ukraine is horrible, I am quite excited about the prospects of shortly leaving the sinful world behind, and falling down before the feet of my Saviour, worshipping Him for who He is, and for His unending love for sinners, who do not deserve what they receive from Him, and who are spared that which they do deserve. I hope this information will motivate you and strengthen you in these final days, as we look up with great anticipation to see our Saviour's return for us. Remember that when Jesus described the end times to his disciples, he said that when these things begin to come to pass, we should expect our escape, because our salvation approaches. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you will receive salvation. Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you placed all of your trust in Him to save you from your sins? Jesus shed His precious blood on the cross to set you free from sin, and your sins being washed away and you becoming a fellow heir with Christ as a son or daughter of God is a free gift to anyone who will accept. The only way in which you can obtain this gift is through faith. You cannot earn it, and you cannot pay God back for it once you have it. Would you not accept His gift of eternal life to you today, while there is still time to do so? Do not trust in your own works to save you, even if those works are the works that you do under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will receive all the glory for every person that He saved, and we can only offer Him our gratitude and worship.